Miniman uh, up to the controller's <laughs> office in Springfield. So um, that, that is uh, quite, quite a shocker and quite a good one indeed. Um, Leslie has a big election coming up in November. Probably everybody here in the room knows that she has to run in a special election. When Judy Bartopinka unfortunately passed away, um, Leslie was supposed to have been appointed to a four-year term, but of course our friends, uh, Mr. Madigan and Mr. Quinn, they rigged it up um, and made it so that Leslie has to run in a special election this coming November. Now, this is gonna be a very important election. Quinn knows it, that's why they set it up this way. They know that Republicans have difficulty and challenges running in the presidential election cycle. So we're all really going to have to get out and um, push hard for Leslie. So I would like you to know, too, that Leslie's going to be running against a woman named Susanna Mendoza. Susanna Mendoza is the city of Chicago clerk. In my humble opinion, she is completely unqualified to serve as the comptroller of the state of Illinois. However, she is Mike Madigan's hand-picked choice which basically means that her sole qualification is that she's the machine candidate. So what's shaping up for November is a situation really where we have the machine versus the citizens of the state of Illinois. And so now I'm gonna to get to my ask. My ask is this, we, as we've been getting ready for the election, we've identified two counties which are the linchpin to success for Leslie. The first county is Lake County, up where we live. But the second county that is essential is Will County. And so what Kathy was saying about generating enthusiasm, getting out the vote here, is going to be of great importance to Leslie. So I'm hoping that all the township chairmen, all the committeemen will um, really work their hardest to help Leslie. I think Leslie is really attractive as a controller candidate because she's somebody that people can vote for and can be excited to vote for. And so as a committeeman, it's easy to make the sell for Leslie because she's such an aspirational person. So I am hoping, I'm hoping my big ask will go through. I'm hoping that everyone will put their shoulder to the wheel, that we can get Leslie elected, and that we can succeed for all our Republican candidates up and down the ballot. So thank you very much. Let me introduce my wife, Leslie. For being here and for giving me an opportunity to introduce myself to you. One thing John did not say is that um, I'm from Will County. I'm from Joliet. I was born and raised here. Uh, my brother Doug. My brother Doug back here. Uh, went to Troy Township Schools, Joliet West graduate. Uh, <coughs> still have family here in the area. And in fact, John and I um, were married in Joliet and our wedding reception was at the old clubhouse here a number of years ago at the Joliet Country. So, um, you know, this is where my roots are. And so, um, I'm really happy to be back here in Will County. Oh, is that a little bit? Can everyone hear me? Um, so, it is, uh, I will tell you that a year and a half ago, if you would have asked me if I would be standing here as your comptroller, I never would have believed it. Uh, I had um, better Republican a committeeman in Lake County and Verdon Township where we live. I decided, after talking a lot with John and some other people who had nudged me along to run for state representative in my area to try to take out uh, our rep who was just a Mike Madigan rubber stamp. And um, I came really close. I came within about a thousand votes of beating her. I was unsuccessful. And I had put my credentials into the governor's transition team, really hoping that I might be chosen to be a trustee at University of Illinois, where John and I and both of our sons are uh, alums now. And uh, I, I put it all in there, that was in November. Then in the interim, Judy Bartopinka passed away suddenly and right after the first of the year, the governor called me, his, his chief of staff called and um, asked if I would consider talking to them because I was on a short list of names they were considering for the comptroller and a week later I was sworn in. So it's been a crazy time since then. I never in my wildest dreams thought I would be here as a comptroller um, from uh, starting as a committeeman. But um, I'm really, honored and grateful for the opportunity because one thing we learn knocking on a lot of doors is you know really we need to get our state back on a better track and so now as the comptroller uh, I have a very large megaphone that I get as the comptroller I take it all over the state and try to educate people and lead good policies uh, and, and, and and try to get people understanding what's happening in the state um, one of the things that we learned as committeemen, and we still try to do, is people will usually say, you know, tell me three things that I can tell 
uh, a vote at the door about why they should support you. And uh, because we all know we just have a few, you know, 30 seconds at those doors. And I think the first thing is, um, I am new to state government. This is the first time I've ever had a government job. I'm 15 months into it. I, I guess I am the incumbent, but compared to my opponent, who's been in state and, and city government for 15 plus years, I'm really the newcomer here. I am the outsider. And I am really a citizen volunteer. I gave up taking a state paid pension. Uh, I'm not taking state paid health care. Uh, I'm really here to just serve the state. I'm a big supporter of term limits. And so uh, I'm really here to serve the state and to try and help make a difference. And because I didn't come because I needed this job, it gives me great power to try and do what I think is right. And so, you know, I don't have to worry about, um, you know, what my career is going to be like down the road because it really, the, the idea is to just get the state back on a strong track. So that's the first thing. Citizen volunteer, no pension, just here to try and get the state turned around. The second thing is, um, and I don't mean to sound immodest, but um, I think my qualifications, the background I have, really make me well qualified for this position as comptroller. Um, I have a master's in business from Northwestern. I spent 25 years in the private sector at companies leading big brands. I worked at McKinsey & Company, Procter & Gamble. I spent 17 years of my career at Hilling Curtis. Everybody's heard of Swash Shampoo, Degrady, Perspirant, all brands I led at one point or another. Um, I eventually had responsibility for the $800 million U.S. hair care business. So I understand budgets. I understand managing large staffs of people. I understand financial responsibility and delivering on what you promise to shareholders and having to cut costs and still have strong, healthy businesses, or in this case, programs in the state, you know, for the future. And um, the other thing I've done in my volunteer time is to be a um, longtime volunteer and a board of directors member at an organization that serves developmentally disabled adults. And one thing the state does is we have a lot of social services that we have to help support and provide for a social safety net. And so my years on the board of um, the Riverside Foundation up in Lincolnshire, where we live, really helped me see how important state funding is and a predictable payment stream. And I've worked very hard as the comptroller to prioritize payments to those nonprofits who serve those most in need, to help them keep their doors open, to help them serving those in our state who are most vulnerable while we um, try and run our state 11 months into our fiscal year without a budget. Um, and so the second thing is, uh, so I guess maybe just to recap, I, I really, I think my credentials are well suited for this job. And um, really, the third thing is um, I am really focused like a laser on trying to bring good fiscal policy back to our state. If you look at my Facebook page, um, I have a balanced Illinois budget, a hashtag balance IL budget. I try to call out things that are going in the state over and over again that are not right. Like how our legislature has spent, instead of working on a budget, uh, a lot of time voting on things like what our state artifact is going to be and making sure that catfish is a part of the list of things that we can uh, fish or hunt for with a spear or a, uh, an underwater air gun. Or uh, outlawing us carrying flamethrowers, which I see a lot of people have uh, their flamethrowers with them tonight. And they even passed a resolution to resolve that they get a budget in place, but they still haven't had a budget. So this is the kind of stuff they do. I try to call that out because I think we ought to know what the people who we elect to send to Springfield are doing with their time. We're paying their salaries. We are taxpayers. And, and this is how they're using you know, our harder taxpayers to vote for this kind of stuff. Um, the other thing I've done is try and lead by example, um, good fiscal policy. When I took office as a comptroller last year, I challenged my staff to put 10% out of our budget. Um, we consolidated apartments, we cross-trained people, we did not rehire open positions. We are down almost 20% in headcount in my office. And I'd say we are running the comptroller's office well in the most challenging year we have ever had in state government. 11 months, only state in the nation without a budget right now. Um, I turned a million dollars back to taxpayers at the end of last fiscal year. The budget I asked for for this year, even though we don't have a budget in place yet, was 10% lower, and we are doing that again for our next fiscal year I just presented. Right now. I'm also working closely with the governor, CIO, to lead the implementation of a new statewide accounting system that um, will help us simplify our practices uh, reduce a lot of costs and actually will end up, once it's up and running, save the state half a billion dollars annually. It's going to take us five years to get it fully implemented, but we did start the pilot a year ago and we are going to get it done. So all these things are big, taking costs out of our government 
And um, the other thing I really tried to do, I really this notion of being a good fiscal steward, is to really try and help educate people about what is going on in the state. Um, some of you, I've been here to talk now, Julia, several times um, about, I, I go through all the financial situation in the state, that we have $7 billion of unpaid bills and what we can legally make payments on. We have part of our government we can't pay anything on right now because we don't have a budget. We have about another $2 billion of the bills that we are accruing on that that we will owe. We have $110 billion in unfunded pension liabilities and we have $100 million in cash. And I, I take these numbers around, people say, how come we can't pay for this? And I say, because we have $7 billion of bills, we can't pay, we are out of money. Um, but one thing I learned is that the numbers are so big, people don't understand them. So I started taking six zeros off of all the numbers. And um, by taking six zeros off and saying, if you like sitting down at your own table and you have $100 in your bank account, you have $7,000 in front of you of bills you have to pay. You have $2,000 of the bills coming in the mail because that's our unfunded part of our government. And if you open up your credit card statement to see what you owe on our unfunded pension liability, you would see a bill of $110,000 and you have $100. And when I, I take that message around, I think people really start understanding the magnitude of the problems that we have in the state. Um, that we really are out of money. And it's not because we have a new governor and we have one year of no budget. It's because we've had 15 years of unbalanced budgets. And decades. terrible financial decisions, things promised and not paid for and not funded. And now it's all hitting us. And so we can point a lot of fingers, which is what goes on in Springfield, or we can say, we can't go on like this. We've got to solve it. And so let's focus on getting solutions that will get us out of this and put us on a path for a growing economy where people have jobs, because really the solution to these problems that we have now are putting people back to work, getting our economy growing, um, and, and be, having a robust job environment. That is the solution out of the mess in Illinois right now. And I uh, was talking to a couple of some school board members earlier. Uh, the next thing I'm working on to try and simplify to make it really easy is I have all the numbers on what the school funding is, a real hot topic since uh, our, some of our legislators are trying to take uh, money that we get in the suburban school districts, make it even less from the state, and funnel them into Chicago to bail them out. Well, now I have the facts on that, and so um, I'm going to send some information to your school board members here, but I'm going to be uh, presenting a, num a very simplified way so that people, and the average person, will be able to understand why this is such a mess and why it's not a good idea to send more money to Chicago. So um, <laughs> these, are, these are just some of the things I'm working on, trying to be transparent, trying to lead good policy decisions in the state that will help us get us on a good track. And um, I am here to really just try and help our state. Born and raised here, here in Joliet, went to U of I. We live in Lake County now. We're Illinoisans through and through. We want to see our state get back to a strong place. And I would really appreciate your support in helping me get there. So All right. thank you. Thank you. Yeah. How long has Mike Madigan been Speaker of the House? Is it 32 of the last 34 years? Uh, he was Speaker in 1984, every, everything but two years since 1984. So, so 32. 30 of the last 32 yes, yes, years. Then. Yes. Okay. It's, and actually, I'll tell you, so a lot of times, that you, a number of people will usually ask me, because Judy Bartopinka, my predecessor, talked about a lot about consolidating the um, Comptroller and Treasurer's Office. It actually saves our state $12 million, and um, I'm a big fan of that. Anywhere we can save money, it's you know hard-earned money. We ought to be taking costs out of the system. It passed the Senate unanimously a couple years ago. It requires a constitutional amendment, so we have to have legislation. The Senate passed it. It went to the House. Mike Madigan will not call that legislation for a vote because, as I understand, he was there in the convention in 1970 when they put that, um, when they split it apart, and he thinks there's good reason to have it apart. I think, okay, since then, we have microwaves, we have computers, we have cell phones, maybe it's time to try something different, and if that isn't the best excuse for term limits, I don't know what is. So. <laughs> I guess it goes under the heading of just trying to be a, a leader in good government. And is um, you may have read in the news a, a few, couple weeks ago 
Um, I made a lot of news and headlines around the state because, as we all know, we have a lot of bills waiting to be paid. If you are a small business that does business with the state, you probably haven't gotten much payment from us at all this year. If you're a social service organization connected with one, there are months and months behind. And yet, because of a law passed in 2013 by the legislature, I was paying legislative salaries every single month. They, they voted themselves continuing pay, even in the absence of a budget. And everywhere I went in the state, it just felt so wrong to me that uh, we were paying legislators, um, and I was getting my own salary, the constitutional officers, we were all getting paid on time every month, uh, yet, and, and we're sent to serve, yet the people who, who we are supposed to be serving are waiting months and months if, if they're getting paid at all. And so um, after working, uh, trying to figure out how I could legally get around the law and, and comply with the law, uh, by pay, making the payroll, running the payroll on the due date, but then instead producing a voucher that goes to the back of the line of the bills, I actually put my own salary, all the exec constitutional officers, and all the legislators in the bill line. So now um, the, the payment that was due on April 30th, we don't have our paychecks yet. We'll probably get them sometime in June. And uh, the longer this bill backlog goes on, the larger it grows, the longer it will take for us to get paid. And I think it's really important to send a signal to the legislators that we are there to serve and that we should all be walking in the same shoes yeah. as the people uh, in the state. Yeah. So more questions? Yes, Yeah. Um, in history, a couple states have actually <coughs> declared bankruptcy. Uh, I used to be on the state uh, bank, the <coughs> Illinois Finance Authority, 10 years ago. It was a colossal disaster. Right? Do you think actually forcing the state through a bankruptcy mechanism would help clear all this out? Um, if we could declare bankruptcy, mm -hmm. we probably would be bankrupt right now with the with the, um, the liabilities that we have relative to the assets we have. I was unaware that a state could legally declare bankruptcy. No, they, they, they always say it can until your checks bounce. And you know, there's a point where you're bankrupt and you're insolvent. So, so one of the things, we, we always have money coming into the state. Every single day we get money in because we have um, taxes that come in. We just went through the income tax period. We have quarterly payments that come in period, uh, throughout the year. Uh, we have sales taxes that come in, regular fees, etc. So there's money coming in. There are some very low points of the year. So there's definitely you know peaks and valleys. But we never run out of money. But every single day when we pay as many bills as we can pay, with that, you know, basically $100 for thousands of dollars with the bills or $100 million with the billions, we run out of money every day. Then the next day we have more money. And so when we have large expenses like Medicaid, for example, that I'm legally obligated to make payments on, and we have to pay on a certain timetable to be able to get the federal funds in to, to help offset some of our costs, those bills are one, $1.2 billion frequently. We have to save up cash for a number of days in order to be able to have the money to make that payment. That means nothing else gets paid during that period of time. So this is the cash situation the state is in, but we don't really run out, unfortunately, or maybe we could be totally insolvent. We, I tell people, a municipality can go bankrupt, the federal government can print money, and we can't do either. We have, we have to figure it out and pay our bills. The uh, state has a uh, statute that says that they can't give an unfunded mandate to any local government. I don't remember the number, but there's a state statute for this. Well, if the county, we have numerous unfunded mandates, and I keep telling the county they don't want to listen, of course, but I say just don't tell them we're not going to do them, and they say we'll get sued or we'll lose this money, and go, well, we're not getting any money any. So what's the problem? What can they do to you? And so Actually, I question. did not know that. I'd love to know what that, um, oh, just, uh, one with that the statute is. Put, uh, voting, uh, you have to be able to register to vote and vote in every single precinct instead of like they, our clerk said, at least just do it in one place in the township. Yeah. No, you got to do it every place that you vote. Yeah, the so state is the state is, amount of money. the state is a master at passing all sorts of unfunded mandates and uh, putting additional costs on on our air on our local governments, our school districts, etc. And um, and it's part of the reason our property taxes are so high because in the state we have the highest property taxes now in the country in illinois and so when we talk about um, the tax burden on illinoisans it's it's so high because we have very high sales taxes we have high property taxes um you know the, the 
legislature wants to raise taxes to get out of this mess we're in, I will tell you that if we only solve this just by raising taxes, which is what some in the um, leader, the leadership, in fact, the you know, speaker talks about is just dealing with the revenue side being taxes, we would have to take our income tax rate in Illinois up to about 8% to pay off the backlog of bills that we have now, not even addressing the pension issue. So, um, is there anything that the state can do to us, though, to ignore all their unfunded mandates? Or the schools and ignore They don't have money for lawyers. Uh, you know, I don't know. <laughs> I, I was not aware of that, and I would love to get that information, Steve. I'd love to maybe try and push push on that with the yeah, state. It, Honestly. To me, it's a big problem. I was not aware of that. I did not get to comply. And then you're going yeah. to spend more money. Yeah. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Yes. Yeah. There was a, a couple weeks ago, a big uh, discussion about uh, overpayments to a lot of uh, municipalities and and uh, other districts by the state and that they wanted that uh, hundreds of millions of dollars back because they in improperly paid that. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Um, I missed that discussion, I'm afraid. I didn't know that we had, I, usually we're behind in paying everyone. We, we were quite behind in paying up until December. Is this an old problem from this years back? This was something that was paid out like over the last two years where they had paid out twice as much as they were supposed to in, in state funding. And now they're saying, oh, we made a mistake, we figured it out, now we want our money back. Yeah, oh, good luck with that. Whether it's a fire district or a school district or a city. Uh, I mean, right now they're not paying their money, but they're saying the money they overpaid, they want it back. You didn't hear anything about that? I, you know what, I, just, I, I thought it was a recent thing. You're talking about the thing that, that was hanging around from a couple years ago, from the, that they just figured out that there was nothing. You know, I don't know. So this is something that would be dealt with in the governor and the legislature. I did hear about the fact that it was an old problem. I can't imagine, given the current environment, that they could ever get any money back because we're so behind in paying everything else. Um, we have we have mandates that are expensive. We um, have because there are so many things the state is not funding. Our municipalities are picking up those costs, and now the municipal budgets are being stretched because they're paying for things the state would normally pay for, and so. If our municipality would say, you know, uh -uh, you know, um, I, I don't think the state is going to be able to recoup those. I think that was probably an error from the prior administration, and, and we're going to have to live with it. So I, I don't know how they would be able to do that, to be honest. So thank you all. I really appreciate it. Okay, I'm going to turn the meeting over to uh, Joe Kroll if you want to take the.